Um, okay, so um, this is a, a really interesting show. Um, and it it's just about opening. I think it's supposed to open this weekend officially. Um, so it offers a new view of Cubism um, by presenting its engagement with the age old tradition of Trump Loy painting. Trump Loy uh, deceive the eye, beguiles the viewer with perceptual and psychological games that complicate definitions of truth and fiction. Many qualities seen as cubist fact used by Trump Loy specialists over the centuries. The emphatically flat picture plane, the invasion of the real world into the pictorial one, the mimicry of materials, uh, the inclusion of print media and advertising as coded references to artists, patron, and current events. <clears throat> in, um, in a contest of creative one-upsmanship, the Cubists George Brock, Juan Gris, and Pablo Picasso uh, both parodied classic Trump Loy devices and invented new ways to confound the viewer along with uh, the Cubist painting sculptures collages the exhibition presents examples of European and American Trump Loy paintings from the 17th century through the 19th century there are over 130 pieces in the show um, so I'm going to start off with a quote from Picasso um, Art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth. The artist must convince others of the truthfulness of his lies. So we'll uh, we'll just roll into the next slide here. Okay. Um, Trump Loy, French for deceive the eye, is uh, an artistic term for the highly realistic optical illusion of three-dimensional space and objects on a two-dimensional surface. Um, Trump Loy is most often associated with paintings that tricks the viewer into perceiving painted objects or spaces as real. So you can see two examples here. Um, <clears throat> one from uh, a Roman Pompeian um, uh, still life that was painted directly on on the wall, and then and then the other is this this wonderful bird with, which is actually a reference to um, a story which I'll tell you at this point. Um, there there was a, a Greek painter who who was um, ancient Greek painter who was painting a still life on the wall, and a bird came, laid it down next to it, and tried to peck at one of the, the uh, grapes. <clears throat> Another artist was watching that, and he became jealous of, of, uh, of the, the hyper-realism of that, and whoop, I messed up. Here we go. Excuse me. Um, and he um actually painted another still life and put a drape next to that still life um painted it on the wall the artist who had painted the one the the uh still life with the the grapes and the bird pecking uh came in to see the still life and tried to draw back the drape um so this competitiveness between these painters um, is something that that has been going on, you know, down through the centuries. Um, and this particular painting that we're, this Dutch painting that we're looking at right now is a reference to that. 
and the bird that we saw on the last slide was a reference to the to that the the uh, bird plucking the 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 grape plucking bird. <laughs> so so the painter when he has to draw a round cup knows very well that the opening of the cup is a circle. When he draws an ellipse, therefore, he is not sincere. He is making a concession to the lies of optics and perspective. He is telling a deliberate lie. So, so in order to portray these things as naturalistic, we're, we're using the, the distortions that we observe in looking at the, the, these things. None of this is really fixed, but we'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. When you change your point of view and you change the angle that you're looking at at, at any of these objects, the the sizes of those ellipses, the the relationship between the objects always is constantly changing. So our experience of this is very different. Um, Picasso and Brock were both um, really very much into films. They really loved films and and the changing point of view of the camera angles and things like that were things which really inspired them. Okay. The combination of immaculate illusionism and structure um, uh, in, in this harnet um, gives you a sense of kind of detachment. However, the painting is filled with autobiographical illusions. Um, Harnett's Irish ancestry, in the sheet music, the ballad um, from Thomas Moore's collection of Irish melodies, um, to his uh, commitment to Trump Loy in the symbolic eye embossed on the dangling padlock. Um, I'm gonna try and actually, let's see if I can get this. There it is. I'm gonna try and pull it the zoom so we can look at that. No, yeah, you can see it. Um, so, um, and then uh, basically, um, it it goes right down to you know the, basically there's a there's a card that's down at the the bottom here, which um, is is his uh, address and information about how to get to his studio. Um, the the other thing that that we should probably take a look at while I'm here is I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the details of things like the the nails and the shadows that are cast on the wood, um, and the you know the rust dripping from the 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 hinges staining the the wood. Um, the attention to detail is really remarkable. Uh, Harnett was was a, a, an American painter. Um, okay, Brock depicts violins uh, more than any other instrument. The violin was associated with both classical and folk music, the refined and sentimental, a, a bridging of tastes that appealed to the Cubists' own spirited dialogue with high art and pop culture. Um, here, a single violin is shown from multiple point, multiple viewpoints with selected details of the black um, tailpiece, turn, uh, turning tuning pegs and the scroll. Uh, Brock's skill is used in uh, with the metal comb to create a uh, distinct wood grain. This was something that that he actually learned from his father. He was a, um, 
his father was a, a decorative painter and um, he learned how to do decorative um, faux finishes when he was when he was um, young. And here we go, another 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 Brock. Um, this piece um, it just really gets back to his his love of music, and that that that's something which is repeated in his imagery throughout. Um, okay. It really plays a central role in his work. And the integration of, of um, typeface and things like that in, into these pieces is something that we're going to see over and over again. Uh, okay. Cubist engaged in and disrupted the trompe l'oeil tradition by fracturing and reassembling still life objects from multiple points of view. And again, you can see, you know, basically the violin in here, uh, the, the, the sound holes are facing out to us in the painting and the scroll is, is turned to its side. Okay. So Cezanne was really, um, Basically, there was a uh, 1907 retrospective, which had a really profound effect on, on the modernist painters in Paris. Um, Brock took, took years and went off into the country and painted um, using um, large... Um, um, geometric forms to create landscapes and things like that. Now, this exhibit does not focus too much on that, but what I wanted to do was bring in Cezanne at this point to, to actually talk a bit about the roots of Cubism and how um, important it was. Um, really the the shifting points of view and combining those shifting points of view into one painting was one of the innovations that that Cezanne and that the Cubists pick up on from Cezanne and carry forward. So I'm gonna go to the next one. And I did this drawing. Um, I made the shifting planes of the table really obvious. Cezanne used the shifting points of view as a device to move the viewer's eye around the composition. Um, and, you know, basically what we're, what we're looking at is um, uh, a two-dimensional surface with three-dimensional objects painted on them but there's a shift in the way they're looked at. And each piece of fruit has its own kind of axial perspective. Um, um, but if you look at the table, you can see how the, 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 on the right, it, it's shifting up and on the left, it's shifting down and the, the, the tablecloth is shifting forward and the table shifts underneath the tablecloth and opens up the composition for us to get to the, basically for the fruit to roll out into 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 our laps at this stage of the game um so this is a really important device that that is repeated in in uh Cezanne still lives and Brock and Picasso and Juan Gris, who are the three artists that we're focusing on and that are that are basically focused on in this exhibition, saw that and 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 took that and ran with it. Now, one of the, the other things I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, in, in these early still lives by Brock 
uh, the use of tonal grade gradients to define the, <clears throat> the overlapping planes um, gives the painting a sense of surface and depth. So it's kind of like these, these darks and lights <clears throat> overlap. And here I did a, uh, a sketch just to clarify the objects a little bit more clearly, the, um, uh, the clarinet and, and the bottle and the cup are all in there, but kind of, it takes some work to see them. So I wanted to actually just bring that out so that you could see it. Um, so the vision and perception are not static experiences. Our way of seeing things is constantly shifting. And that's one of the things that the, that the Cubists were fascinated by. Um, the, the other thing that, that I wanted to bring in here is, is the, the Trump Loy painters kind of went out of favor as photography um, came to the fore. So in the 1800s, they, the, their um, um, popularity kind of waned a bit. And by the, by the turn of the century, there was, there was a bit less interest in, in, in what they were doing because there was so, so much new technology at the time that was um, really making realism a very different um, uh, a very different category, shall we say. Okay. Um, this is a Picasso. Um, <clears throat> and Picasso made his first cubist collage by pasting a piece of oil cloth, um, waterproof fabric used for tablecloths, onto an oval uh, canvas depicting a cafe uh, fair um, and a newspaper. This radical act, inserting a fragment of reality into a fictive realm of painting, he ingeniously uh, selected a mass-produced, ready-made visual deception. The machine-printed look like texture of rotan weave used in the chair uh, this piece of oil cloth is materially real, but patently fake. So basically, I'm going to move here so you can see a close up of it. Um, and basically, you can see here a little bit more clearly the oil paint that's over the, the smooth surface of the oil cloth. Um, So they were busy playing a lot of games with with this with this kind of thing. Um, okay, and a scallop shell um, and pipe are references to Trump Loy. Um, the use of the oval for the for the for the canvas also gives you a sense of kind of like the tabletop tabletop in a cafe when you're looking at it from a from a side angle um so they like to play with those those ideas and you know notice the pipe in there and i'm gonna skip on to this one which is a really um basically 1653 oil painting by a Dutch painter. Um, the interesting part about this is the, um, the pipe lighter is, is those coals that are on the table. So the presence of, of a human being is really kind of like integrated into it. It's a little like 
you know, this is this is a cafe, you know, scene, you know, with some things laid out on the table. And that's kind of the the echo that's going on here. Okay. And so the um the thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is the shallow kind of um fool the eye um business in in this still life let me see if i can zoom it all right there you go um so you can see these these shadows cast and the the little messages that are written on the things so there's there's um a game that's being played it 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 actually projects out into the room from the flat surface you know you 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 actually it it is this fool the eye business where you, you're seeing this painted object but they they actually do have a um a sense of being real and being sticking out from the surface and again um this uh this ancient this this legend of the greek painters was something that wasn't lost on juan gri and and wasn't lost on on the the dutch painters that were that were painting before that but integrating this this um uh curtain on the surface of the of the canvas was something that, that was uh, Gris' um, next step in one-upmanship uh, with uh, Brock and Picasso. Okay. And um, it, this is a really beautiful, you know, um, the, you know, the table, is is right up to the surface of the canvas and if you look at the tabletop it's tipped up at us and it's backwards perspective where the back of the table is wider than the front of it so it it actually pulls these things up and into our faces again that 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 business of of um these objects coming out into the room for us to look at that that's kind of what the notion is now there's there's a number of faux finish things that he did you know there's this there's this kind of marble um um uh, mark making and and um beautiful color beautiful shapes really the, the draftsmanship of Picasso is is just really terrific. So throughout all of this, that's that's one of the things that that Picasso brings to the table. Okay. Um, the wood table and crockery and uh, glassware imply an ordinary kitchen um, while the varnished, tile pattern wallpaper um, stands for an oilcloth table cover. Um, two sensational murders are recorded in the front page of the newspaper, generating a, an ominous atmosphere that uh, reinforced the stark tonal contrast now one of the things i want to bring to your attention is the use of of collage was really actually brock was the one that first brought it in he started doing those full finish wood grain things but he also got a hold of of wallpaper that was wood grained and cut it up and pasted it in so this is something which was really common the the practice of using wallpaper and uh, newspapers and um different different um 
photographs, advertising, all kinds of things integrated into the compositions. Um, cut and pasted, printed wallpaper, newspaper, laid paper, oil, gouache, and crayon. These are very inventive pieces. They were using a lot of different media to get really different textures. And you can see Gree was pretty good with the with uh, um, integrating the the um, different media in there. There's some beautiful transparencies, you know, where the the cups shift from plane to plane, and and he he does a really wonderful job at moving the eye around this composition. Okay, um, again, cut and pasted white wove paper, printed wallpapers, newspapers, laid and wove papers. Conte crayon gouache it's it's everything in there um and again the oval is kind of a reference to the tabletop um so it's sort of the ellipse and it it's also this matter of integrating pop culture into the paintings where they're putting these newspapers which are you know up to date it was like last week that that thing happened um this is very different from uh the traditional approach to still life okay shadow play light and shadow shape our perceptions of the world highlights and shading create volume, texture, and depth, and they help us to see relative thickness and thinness of things. A cast shadow is a potent sign for something real, caused by an object that blocks the light and whose shape it mimics in the silhouette thrown upon the adjacent surface. Trump Loy shadows give visual substance to painted illusions and account for the hyper real presence of objects. Artists over the centuries have used shadows to both deceive the eye and reveal the skillful means of this deception. A prime example of is the ubiquitous nail. <laughs> Uh, whose silhouette creates the perception of a fictive third dimension while also pointing to the material reality of the flat canvas. The cubists elaborated on these conceits, foregrounding the magic of chiaroscuro, that light and dark that I was talking about earlier. Exaggerating the cross hatch, exaggerated cross hatching and blending, as well as illogical reversals of light and dark. In 1913, they went further. Picasso pasted and pinned some of his paper cutouts so they would lift slightly off the surface. So they began to become. Um, uh assemblage actually you know that those those surfaces really did come out into the room and brock was known to add many things to his paint he would he would throw sand in he would put in sawdust and build up texture very thick textures so there's a there's the the painted fiction and there's the actual substance of the paint or the object that that are integrated together um, it's a fascinating idea and here is i'm gonna i'm gonna zoom in on this if i can let's see uh, let me see if i can do this um zoom in here we go and this gives you a view of these, you know, you can see the shadows, you can see the nails, 
a wonderful piece, the graining of the wood. Again, you know, basically here's his card. It shows um, where his uh, studio address is um, in case you want to find and buy a painting from him. Uh, <laughs> so this gives you a really clear example of what, of, of that shallow depth, the sense of it coming out into the room. And this is one of the things that, that the, the cubists were playing with. Okay. okay. This painting is uh, from a set of almost 40 still lives by Melendez on display at the Prado ever since the museum opened in 1819. In these masterpieces of deceptive realism, which Picasso and Greece certainly saw, the space is shallow, the background featureless, the crowded table or shelf brought so close uh, to the frontal picture plane that the objects project over its edge and appear to penetrate the viewer's space. Beautifully painted. And here, here is Picasso. Um, again, you know, it, it's it's this this surface, the the way the the um, uh, the darks and lights kind of give you a sense of this being a real shallow depth. Like it, you know, you could almost reach behind that that white surface and 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 grab a hold of that piece so that kind of projecting out into the room business is something that they were all really after and at the same time you know he's integrating this little bass ale bottle and kind of transparency it it's here and it's not here um and the um shape of a guitar um in in the background and the the um the strings of the guitar are kind of integrated into the composition and here we have a beautiful brock different really different kinds of textures layering of of mark making um um and and actually some of those sections i think um you can kind of see though we can't see it in person there there is sand mixed into some of the paint along with the those those dots which which kind of mimic that 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 the feel of that of that thing one of the things that 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 brought was very fascinating the sense of texture the text the the tactile quality of 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 the of the scene of the object of the painting and and so that's one of the things that he really focused on throughout his career where he kept mixing in all all these these different types of things into the canvas into the onto the surface and collaging on things and all of that but mixing things into the paint was was one of his things to do okay and here is you know these pared down um drawings by picasso um it it's um, still that shadow gives the work that kind of shallow depth. So he's kind of 
implying that sense of 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 surface and depth. The table in uh, this domestic breakfast scene is laid with uh, printed wallpaper and brims with autobiographical references, mainly the uh, coffee drinking accessories and the actual Cafe Eugene Martin label. Um, Bree's dealer, Henry uh, Daniel uh, Henry Kahnweiler, remarked that the artist was ex an excessive consumer of caffeine. Um, a uh, fortuitous newspaper fragment um, uh, provided the ready-made signature Gris. The name Juan Gris or John Gray proved to be uh, the finest fiction of all for it was a pseudonym for this man born in 1887, whose uh, real name was Jose Victoriano Comelo Carlos Gonzalez Perez. How's that for a handle? Um, so, you know, one of the things, and one of the, I think one of the great losses is, is uh, Gree died in 27, um in in 1927 so he didn't have quite as long a life as as picasso and and brock really beautiful sensitive colorist and i will show you some more works a little bit later let's see ah yeah. So here we have, again, this business of surface and depth. Um, it's, it's really obvious that shadow makes, makes the, the dimensionality of the checkerboard kind of really stand out in this piece. Again, Juan Cree at, at this point was, was really playing with with very limited range of color, but beautiful color sensibility. Uh, so, um, Louis Leopold Boy. Um, this is this is again. Um, let me see if I can pull up the zoom. Zoom in, and I wanted to show. Yeah. So you know. This is this is you know the shadows around the sides of the coins and things like that. The shadows from one coin to the next coin, incredible detail. And and again, his signature is is contained in a little scrap of paper on the still life. It it's um like he emptied his pockets and scattered them on on onto the surface and then painted it. So this painting is is oil on marble with wood trim. So that wood around the outside edge is actual wood, and the the white piece on the inside is actually marble. Uh, and. You know, the, this business of, of taking pop culture and integrating it in, into painting. Um, this is um, a dollar bill, one silver dollar. Um, uh, this American painter, um, this, this piece is relatively small. It's like nine by 12 inches or eight by 12 inches. Um, and then Jasper Johns picking up on that 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 integrating the pop object and making that his still life. Now um, I don't I don't have any of the uh, Jasper Johns pieces, but he certainly used a lot of the um, cubist notions 
um, uh, to define his spaces in many of his paintings. He uses that, that um, uh, kind of faux um, uh, quality where there's shadows cast within the painting. Um, but, you know, that's another conversation and that's not in this show in, at the Metropolitan. They are really concentrating on the Trump Loy connection for the 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 um the cubists and one of the one of the whole one of the things that comes out in all of this is they are parodying and 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 on the one hand making fun of this old style and also at the same time integrating it and using it and recycling the 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 ideas into their more contemporary work. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm gonna move beyond the show. They really concentrated on um, about 1911 up to about 1915, but these artists went on to, to carry further these these ideas and this wonderful one gree from 1918 um i wanted to wanted to show you um and here is the more vibrant colors the much more um uh about color planes and interactions of color rather than the 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 faux um, business, although, you know, you've got this book in the foreground, which has this exaggerated perspective and, and um, really beautiful color, again, Hungary and George Brock on the right, this is from 1938, this is much further along. So the degree is from one year before he died. Um, the Brock is, much later on in his career um, and really wonderful, you know, color spaces that he's, that he's getting into. A lot of Brock's work from the last couple of decades revolve around still lives set up within his studio and studio references are there. So one of the things that, that, um, they are carrying from the Trump Loy tradition, which is references to other artists, references to to um, their environment, uh, integrating everyday objects. And here's another wonderful Brock at the Phillips Collection. Uh, from 1929. And you can see probably a little bit more clearly in here, the sand that's, that's in the paint in that background and in, in the planes of color. Um, so it's got a very tactile, very, um, there's a presence to the paint that's very substantial. And here's another wonderful late Brock uh, on the left. And, um, and now we're gonna do a nod to Picasso and where he went, which was very broad and wide ranging. His, his, um, um, his genius as a draftsman, his, his inventiveness as an artist is, is, is to me, more important than than his his um, Brock was a greater painter, but the 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 artistic range of of Picasso is astounding. The imagery and changes that he went through, and stylistic shifts 
the restlessness and, and exploration, you know, where he would, he would explore such a wide range and variety of styles and approaches and ideas in his work. Many of those ideas would have been, any one of those ideas would, would have been enough for another artist. Um, so he was quite the fellow. Uh, okay. And I, I put in, there's, there's a wonderful lecture by Karen Wilkin uh, on George Brock. There are going to be a bunch of talks on, the, on this Trump Loy, um, uh, Cubism and Trump Loy exhibition at the Met. Um, and you can go to the website, go to the, the Met website and look for it. On November 3rd, I believe it is, there's an online gallery talk by the curators. And there will be, I'm sure that there will be lectures down the road, but they don't have them listed easily accessible right now on the website. Um, and so that is about it, unless there are any questions. Nope, there's no questions that I'm seeing, Larry. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> okay, do you, the next one? Do you remember? Uh, no. Oh, that's too much. That's okay. <laughs> it's not that kind of day. All yeah. right, everybody. I hope we see you tomorrow at the uh, Folklore Urbano at four o'clock at the library. And uh, if not, have a nice weekend. It's supposed to rain on Sunday. That's all I know. Okay, bye, everyone.